please help me welcome up uh, Miss Ann Coulter. skills. Um, so <laughs> congratulations to you. I'm, I'm proud to be here. Um, you're probably all hoping I was going to speak tonight about ISIS or Brian Williams, since that's all the media seems to be covering. <laughs> uh, you can always tell the media is hiding something when they start obsessively covering Muslim atrocities. You could cover Muslim atrocities from the beginning of time until the end of time without ever repeating yourself. So why are they suddenly so fixated on this? It always tells me they're hiding something. Uh, ISIS poses absolutely no threat to Americans, provided you take this one precaution. I'm giving you free. Don't go to Syria. <laughs> ISIS has killed four Americans, all of them in Syria. So it's not exactly 9-11. Uh, but, but why is the media obsessively covering? ISIS, we know if, 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 if ISIS were a category on Jeopardy, TV pundits would, would run the table. They know everything. They know how ISIS, they enjoy pornography, and uh, who, the, who Jihad John may be. It's day in, day out. Well, you young people, maybe you don't watch TV. But if you turn on your TV right now, I promise you they are talking about ISIS. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the public knows not at all that Democrats have been filibustering Obama's executive amnesty for the past two weeks. That was the biggest issue in the last election. Republicans promised us that if they were elected, they would stop the executive amnesty. Democrats running for office last November all swore up and down that they opposed Obama's executive amnesty, but now they're filibustering. Now they're fighting like banshees. But no, we don't hear anything about that. Uh, we don't know that Obama's amnesty is not his prosecutorial discretion simply not to hound illegal immigrants out of the country. No, to the contrary, he'll be issuing all illegal immigrants, work permits, social security cards, and about $25,000 in welfare payments. They instantly get back earned income tax credits, $25,000 a piece out of the US Treasury. I would like to sign up for that. But a tough year. Uh, to review, ISIS has killed Four Americans in Syria. <laughs> Illegal immigrants have killed, raped, maimed thousands of Americans right here in America. In order to be harmed by ISIS, you must get on a plane, uh, transfer in Algeria, get a cab in Damascus. It's a total nightmare. So if you're thinking of going there for spring break, do not go to Syria. <laughs> Uh, by contrast, you can be killed by an illegal alien right here in the privacy of your own home. And if you are the victim of an illegal immigrant crime, you used to be able to access the greatest health care in the world. But that's no longer true thanks to Obamacare. ISIS will not change our country forever. Immigration and Obamacare will. So I thought we'd talk about those two. A little more time on that tonight. Uh, for those of you lucky enough to have an Obamacare waiver, let me just say you have no idea what's coming. <laughs> you, to paraphrase every cheesy horror movie, go back, go back, it's a trap. Obamacare isn't health insurance at all. What it is, is a giant welfare program designed to look like insurance. Uh, actual health insurance has been made illegal, <laughs> punishable by death camp panel, I understand. Um, I actually got a letter from my insurer, I'm self-employed, telling me your insurance is illegal. I was completely uninsured last year, and now I have an insurance program. I get out of Penn Station. It's, you know, shoe shine, health care. <laughs> the problem with Obamacare is it's mathematically impossible. You cannot be funding all the uninsured health insurance, uh, covering prenatal counseling, uh, marriage counseling, gambling addiction therapy, uh, speech therapy, hearing therapy, aromatherapy. Uh, also covering people with pre-existing conditions, and also pay for your cancer treatment. No, insurance companies would go out of business if they did that, so your cancer treatment has to go. 
not being able to reject applicants with pre-existing conditions is like telling you know, fire insurance companies, um, you have to insure the guy whose house is on fire right now. No, that's not insurance. It's insurance is something you buy in case something happens to you in the future. In fact, when I was, a lot of my friends are self-employed, um, bloggers, Matt Drudge, writers, so on. So we were, we were all talking to one another when all our insurance was declared illegal. Um, and, and I was fuming around pacing, trying to find some alternative insurance plan, and I thought, I know, if all of us got together, we could pool our money, we'd each pay in a small amount e each month, and if any of us got hit with some horrible dread disease, we'd use that. Oh no, sorry, that's insurance, that's illegal. That's insurance. <laughs> that's why we can only buy something called insurance, but it's a welfare program that you pay for through your insurance premiums. You can call it insurance, but um, it's, not, it's not insurance, just the same way your, your, your dad's sending you money every month at college. He can call it insurance, but you're gonna spend it however you want and he'll never get it back. Obamacare is the most regressive tax in world history. Uh, this doesn't mean we aren't going to pay for the poor, but it is done in this regressive way, which is to say the traditional welfare program Everybody pays in a certain amount in taxes, income taxes. If you make a lot of money, you pay more. If you pay a medium amount of money, you pay a medium amount. It goes to Washington, that money goes out to poor people. That's not how taxes are collected for, to pay for the poor's health insurance. Instead, you pay it through your insurance premium and we all pay the same amount. I will pay the same amount for my health insurance as Michael Bloomberg does. Michael Bloomberg is worth $31 billion dollars um, depending on where the stock market closed today, I'm worth about $31. But we will pay the exact same amount. There is no other tax like this. It's a poll tax. For each person, you pay the same amount. It's a massive tax hike on the middle class. I keep, I keep thinking that, you know, we made fun of Nancy Pelosi for saying we have to pass it to find out what's in it. But, you know, I liked Obamacare a lot better before I knew what was in it. Obamacare became law not because the public was clamoring for the federal government to take over our health insurance, uh, but because the Democrats had 60 votes. Obamacare was passed with one party sneering, nah, nah, we've got 60 votes. Never has such a major piece of legislation passed entirely on partisan lines. Every other major program, Social Security, um, Reagan's tax cuts, passed with, with bipartisan support. No, not this, not one Republican, not in the House and the, or the Senate voted for Obamacare. But liberals explained, um, no, no, my roommate and I figured all this out. We were Rhodes Scholars, trust us. We worked it all out on paper, which is the history of liberalism, replacing something with work that works with something that sounded good on paper. Meanwhile, Republicans, or rather Americans, kept saying, oh, really, do we have to scratch the whole system? Do we have to start from scratch? Since it passed, a, a majority of Americans, um, and uh, to, to quote Michelle Obama, I've never been so proud of my country, since it has passed, a majority of Americans have continuously favored Obamacare's repeal. The Democrats' only defense to this monstrosity, and you'll hear it all the time, you'll hear it in the upcoming presidential debates, uh, is, is, is to claim that Republicans have no alternative plan. But you can look it up tonight, if Republicans have, all have, basically the same alternative plan. Even McCain, and I'm sure he didn't write it, had a beautiful alternative plan. Romney had an alternative plan. The Republicans have passed, I think, 50 bills in the House with an alternative plan. I have an alternative plan. It's a little something I've been working on. I like to call it the free market. <laughs> My idea is we allow individuals to shop for plans to get them the best services at the lowest prices. My reasoning is, Everything since the history, in the history of time, everything provided on the free market over time gets better and cheaper. Whereas everything provided by the government over time gets more expensive and worse. Thus, for example, the government gave us the post office, public education, welfare, <laughs> social security, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, the earned income tax credit, the most broad written program in <laughs> In, in the country, and that's saying something. 
The Amtrak Food Service, long one of my favorite federal programs. It's a monopoly. Sometimes I speak in the Midwest, they don't ride Amtrak. I hope some of you have taken Amtrak. You know you're trapped there. They will finally announce that the food car is open for like 20 minutes of every seven, seven hour trip. Um, you get in line for an hour, and by the time you get there, um, there's a three week old turkey sandwich for $10. Last year, Amtrak Food Service, with a monopoly, lost $72 million. <laughs> Only the government can lose money with a monopoly. Uh, meanwhile, the free market has given us ever better and cheaper cell phones, uh, inexpensive plane travel, the only bad part of plane travel is the part that's run by the government, uh, flat screen TVs, Uber, Netflix, Jerry G Garcia, Chia Pets, on the, on the way out here, I got I got the full pat down from a tall, handsome TSA agent, so I went through the line again. So it's not all bad. <laughs> uh, consequently, my idea is, and Republicans are, are free to steal it, uh, we should get our health care system on the, on the same system that gave us FedEx and the iPhone, and not the system that gave us the Internal Revenue Service and Perry Reed. That's my idea. Are you all with me here? <coughs> Imagine if Democrats had, had decided back in the 1980s that cell phones were so important we needed a national cell, cell care program. Um, cell phones today would be the size of this podium. <laughs> They'd cost $1,000 a piece and would not have the number six. <laughs> but liberals can't learn from what's right in front of them. Mollusks can learn. Viruses learn. But Democrats cannot learn everything provided by the free market turns less expensive and works better over time. Republicans are pretty good at learning on everything except immigration. Their donors want cheap labor. And the uh, Re Re Republican Party, they're like drug addicts for the campaign cash. And just like drug addicts, if we don't stop them, they're going to kill themselves. We got our immigration policies from Teddy Kennedy, who designed the 1965 Immigration Act in order to create a country that was um, um, full of people more likely to vote Democrat. You'll find this on Teddy's highlight reel after, right after the part where he killed that girl. Do not imagine that liberals have been winning over the public with their dazzling arguments. No, 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 they, they changed the jury. <laughs> they changed who's voting. Uh, in fact, uh, as I pointed out one million times, um, if this were the same country ethnically, as it was in 1980, Mitt Romney would have won a bigger victory in 2012 than Ronald Reagan won in 1980. So I'm sick of hearing about how Romney was no Ronald Reagan. No, 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 he was better than Ronald Reagan. The country has changed and it's changed by design. You might say the Democrats are outsourcing democracy. Without Teddy Kennedy's uh, Immigration Act, uh, all kinds of elections, they could we used to win, we would keep winning. California, that's where we got Ronald Reagan. That's where we got Richard Nixon. <laughs> California used to be rock solid Republican. Not anymore. Uh, this, this does, in fact, not have anything to do with ethnicity. Immigrants have always been in the Democratic Party. The Democrats are the foreign party, Republicans are the American party. Um, it's, 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 it's inevitable because we're the freest country in the world. So by definition, any immigrant who comes in will be more status than Americans already here. It's just like Finland. Any immigrant they take will make Finland less white. It's a very white country. And recent immigrants have been block voting for the Democrats. It's just like voting back home minus the headings. It's a dirty trick Democrats have pulled because by far the largest immigrant group, both legal immigrants and illegal immigrants, um, are Mexicans. And you can't hate them. They're such hard workers. Uh, but it's going to wreck the country if it, if, if it isn't stopped for a while. We need a moratorium both for the Mexican immigrants and low-wage workers and blacks in this country. We'll win them over, all immigrants over eventually. But consider it took us 100 years to get Irish and Italian immigrants from the turn of the century to become Republicans. It took a century plus Ronald Reagan to get those immigrants to flip. Uh, but now we're trying to do the sorcerer's apprentice thing, where we're trying to convert the new immigrants to, to freedom and republicanism and conservatism, while bringing in another million immigrants every year. 
Look at what happened to, to, to Vermont. Vermont was another state, rock-rimmed Republican Vermont, and they got immigrants from New York. Now look at it. One senator is a Democrat, the other one is a socialist. Every single poll on the subject shows that today's immigrants overwhelmingly support big government. Hispanics, for example, by far are the most supportive of Obamacare. They support Obamacare for, by about 75%, whereas polls of all Americans support uh, Obamacare only by 26%. This is, this is what they're used to in their home countries, like New Yorkers going to Vermont. Uh, the Republican, the official Republican Party's response is to think that maybe if we bring in more immigrants, the immigrants already here will hate our guts a little bit less. They still won't vote Republican, but when they vote, they won't have an angry glint in their eyes. Republicans seem not to realize if they can't vote, they can't vote against you. <laughs> Voting machines don't register angry glints. Legal immigrants don't care about amnesty, they're already in. Hispanics support the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is the party of big government. And the Democrats know that perfectly well. When Obama was running his Spanish language ads in 2012, he didn't talk about amnesty, he talked about Obamacare. I'm gonna give you all free Obamacare. Republicans are under no obligation to wreck the country just because Democrats want another 30 million votes. They're just gonna to have to come up with another way to get those 30 million votes. But we can't have a rational discussion about immigration <laughs> because instantly liberals will will use the magical word racist. Uh, no, if anyone has a right to be saying racist here, it's those of us who are opposed to this dump of low wage workers on America. I notice that we're not bringing in immigrants who are going to compete with, with senators or newspaper writers or lawyers or, or TV producers. No, they don't want anyone competing with them or their kids. They want people who will compete with their landscapers' kids. And who's hurt the most by this? Study after study, African Americans. Low wage workers hurt the most. This is why Barbara Jordan, the great civil rights hero, wrote up a famous report opposing immigration, calling for a halt to immigration because it was hurting blacks, African Americans the most. They're our fellow Americans. We owe them something more than we owe someone who's never set foot in this country. Oh, and you know who else is hurt by the constant importation of low wage workers? The Hispanics already here the ones who came last year, and the year before that, and the year before that. But Democrats don't care. They, they always had this line, the Republicans only care, about, only care about the fetus until it's born. Well, I say Democrats only care about immigrants until they can vote. They don't care that they're driving their wages down by bringing in more and more low-wage workers. They don't care that they're bankrupting our social safety net. They just want the votes. And I promise you, if, if, if the the illegal immigrants coming across the border voted two to one for the Republicans rather than two to one for the Democrats, Chuck Schumer would be down on the border with the Minutemen. It's kind of touching that Democrats realize they'd never get Americans to vote for them and they had to import new voters. I can understand why they want this constant influx of foreigners voting in American elections. What I can't understand is why Republicans are helping them. Oh wait, no, now I remember. Because their donors want more cheap labor. Everyone in favor of amnesty is in favor of it for his own reason. Democrats want the votes, Republicans want the campaign cash, uh, rich people want the low wage servants. You will notice that none of these reasons have anything to do with what's good for the country. I always tell people if you're not sure what your position on immigration is, ask yourself, um, do I have a chauffeur, a pool boy, a cook, a maid, a generalized need for a lot of low-wage labor? Because if you don't, immigration is a net loss to you as a taxpayer. As the saying goes, cheap labor is only cheap for the employer. We're subsidizing their cheap labor. Republican politicians are just going to have to get um, their donors and the lobbying class in a car, drive them around with a gun to their heads, and tell them, we can give you tax reform, we can give you tort reform, we can give you regulatory reform, but you can't have everything. And if you insist that we pass amnesty, we will not be in a position to ever give you anything else again, and you're just gonna have to take your chances with Nancy Pelosi. If Republicans don't block Obama's executive 
amnesty, which for the moment has been blocked by a federal court, but not by you know our hairy-chested Republicans in the Senate, uh, there will be no reason to care about politics anymore. I mean, I guess that's fine for you. You're engineers, but you might care about the kind of country you live in. Within a few years, the whole country will be California. And I don't mean to be harsh, but you'll all be the Kardashians. <laughs> There will be no reason for Fox News, for conservative talk radio, for, for speaking lovely events like this. Uh, there will, uh, all we'll have to do is organize the death panels for the people who destroyed America and, and map out whose graves need to be desecrated. Immigration is the key to everything. It's a referendum on, on whether the Democrats should be allowed to establish their political hegemony for all time. We'll have the Chuck Schumer Democrat Party and the Nancy Pelosi Democratic Party. Any other bad law can be repealed. Even Obamacare can be repealed, and gosh, I hope it will be. The amnesty is permanent. It can't be undone. Immigration is the one issue about which the base and Americans who care about their fellow African Americans and care about low-wage workers have to say, this is it. We voted for you, but you screw us one more time, and we're out. Thank you. I'll take your questions now. their jobs, low labor, easy tasks with automation and robotics? Well, I'm all for it because it's technology. Uh, so how is that really different from immigrants taking people's jobs? Because robots I don't have to pay welfare for. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I wish you could get going on that Roomba thing a little bit better. Those work yet because that's the one thing I'm really bad at. <laughs> And just one footnote to that. This is what drives me crazy about these farmers telling us their crops are rotting in the fields. You guys are tech guys, so you probably know this, but I asked one of my Silicon Valley friends, hey, can't you invent a machine to start you know, picking these grapes or something? And he said, Anne, there is. There is a machine that will pick tomatoes. They just don't want to spend another five cents. They don't, they don't want to change. They will, why do they want cheap labor? Um, why does a dog scratch itself? Because it can't. Uh, I just have a quick question. How do you think um, when quantitative, quantitative easing ends and inflation rates, sorry, not inflation rates, um, interest rates go back to normal, what do you think is going to happen? I, I, this is not my area, but I have a very strong opinion. Okay. I, I, <laughs> I mean, it hasn't happened just yet, so I'm already wrong on one prediction, which suggests that perhaps you shouldn't believe anything I say in this answer, but this whole quantitative easing. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends. You guys are still in school. I have friends in all different lines of work. The economy is really, really bad. Really bad. I'm very sorry that you'll be graduating soon. But in all different kinds of work, um, architects, movies, books, I can tell you from personal experience, the economy is bad. The reason we don't feel it around here is because Janet Yellen is sending taxpayer money to Wall Street. That's keeping the stock market high, and it's the damnedest thing seeing liberals talk about them on MSNBC bragging about how high the stock market is. I'm sorry, I thought you guys were the party of the little people. So uh, for one thing, I suspect there's going to be a pretty big stock market crash, and people I know who, who know more than I do, I'm, and this is why I've lost lots of money from that $31 I told you I had. <laughs> um, I mean, I've been warned by smarter people than I am who follow this, that it, this is fake. Do not trust these stock market numbers going up. Even if you look specifically at this company or that company, you might say this is okay. But, but this is artificial pumping to make the economy look good. And when that money comes out, now the prediction I made that I was apparently wrong on, but maybe they're waiting for, for, for some, I don't know, for them to block Obama's amnesty or something. I thought that it, if Republicans won big in the last election, and they did, 
Um, Yellen would wait for the Republicans to come in, yank the pumping, so that stupid people would say, oh, we elected Republicans, the stock market failed. But she hasn't done that yet. Thank you so much. Hi. So um, my question is, uh, you seem to have a lot of very controversial opinions about race, gender, whatever, uh, political opinion, whatever. Um, I was wondering if, um, uh, and excuse me if I come off uh, offending you, but I was wondering if uh, those opinions are true and you do believe those, or if it's just kind of like a thing to get people watching and uh, engaging with you. And, well, I don't you know. think my opinions are controversial. I just gave a speech in which I think I was pretty full-throated in my defense of African Americans and why we should care about them more than someone who is not an American and that we need to take care of our own. Um, oh, true, I think we should take the women's vote away. So I suppose you could call that controversial. Though, in my, I think it's perfectly rational. It was a rational experiment. It didn't work. <laughs> That's a joke, but in fact, <laughs> single women vote very badly. And I really, I'd give up my vote if you gals would too. Um, married women are vote more Republican than married men. It's single, divorced, never married, myself, in case to the contrary, <laughs> um, tend to be very liberal. And I mean, I've written about it. I think it's because. Um, because the government keeps stepping in and saying, we'll be your husband, we'll take care of you, we'll provide you with Sandra Fluke with your birth control, and if men were, were responsible and didn't cheat or divorce their wives, we'd have a lot more Republican women. But Republican women, or rather women, are conservative on a lot of the issues that I care about. Women, no matter who takes the poll, or how, where the numbers are generally, women are overwhelmingly more opposed to abortion than men are. I mean, again, it could be Planned Parenthood saying 10% of men and 20% of women are pro-life, but it's always more women than men, contrary to the image out there. But I, I don't, I mean, other than women's suffrage, I don't think my opinions are particularly controversial, and I think I'll win you over on women's suffrage. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, you mentioned that you're against uh, the government or government providing health care, but most or all other major countries in the world provide health care as a right to all citizens, and America is the only one. And they, on average, pay less than the American does. Why are you against this? Well, we also live longer and cure cancer more. I mean, this and the fact that other countries do this is a, a beautiful question because it dovetails into the speech I just gave. We're different from other countries. We won't be if we bring other countries to vote here anymore. Um, or can, if there's never a pause in this and we change the suffrage. Um, but over, I mean, clearly American, Americans, have to, Americans have the best health care and the genuine numbers, there are a lot of fake numbers going around considering what our population is. Um, I mean, the survival rates for cancer, that is a pretty good apples to apples comparison. It's hard to compare some other things in the healthcare realm. And it's just jaw dropping how much more likely you are to survive cancer, or it has been until now. And hopefully Obamacare won't, <laughs> won't destroy it too quickly so we can repeal it and get that back again. Um, but then what about prescription drug prices where if you go across the border in Canada where they have a single payer healthcare system, they are of one by 10%. Yeah, I'll tell you why that is. Price. It's the free market that creates those drugs that would not be created otherwise because there's a single buyer in other countries for national health care. They just say, so you have a pill that will cure, um, you know, ovarian cancer. They'll just say, sorry, we're not paying that. Well, then at that point, I mean, it's how I sell the foreign rights to my books. Um, I'm usually offered a couple thousand dollars for the foreign rights. Well, okay, it's that or nothing. That's what the offer is, so sure, I'll take a couple thousand dollars. That's what drug companies do in this country because people are willing to pay to live. In, in those countries, it's not the people deciding. It's the government saying, no, we'll just skip that bill. So the drug companies figure, well, whatever we sell it to them for, it's gonna be better than collecting nothing. <coughs> 
But it's because they don't care about their people. They care about keeping expenses low, as it will be in this country. There will be no com drug companies spending all of that money to, to invent amazing new drugs and bring them to market. But then why do companies... Okay, you're going to have to wrap it up. Last question. Then why do companies that uh, are these, these drug companies, why does the majority of their money go to advertising and not do drug research? I think that is a BS statistic. Uh, you can it's, look it up. Yes, it's, it's, you it's can look it up too. Statistic. When it's a million dollars to bring a drug to market, they do not spend a million dollars on advertising. <laughs> no, that's crazy. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Ms. Coulter. One thing I and by the way, I don't know what that would have to do with my answer anyway, but that is a BS statistic. It's a million dollars to create, on average, a new drug, but so what if they spend more on advertising? Bullshit statistic has nothing to do with what I just said. Good evening. Um, one thing that I think gets lost in talk about Amtrak and infrastructure is that with Amtrak, anywhere you go, you pay that fare, and that fare contributes to the maintenance of the rail cars and the maintenance of the infrastructure, which is not true on 99% of the vast majority, we'll say, of the interstate toll, excuse me, right. interstate road system. So given that, what would you say about putting tolls on most of the limited access highways of the United States so that the user paid for the use of the roads I couldn't agree more, and it drives me mad, and most people don't know what you just said. When you go across the George Washington Bridge, you think you're paying a toll so that you won't be hitting potholes the whole way. Oh, no, 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 that, that goes, that's spent by somebody else. No, I, I, yeah, you pay a toll for, so that road will be paved, so that bridge will be built. No, it drives me crazy that they do that. Right. It's another, it's another fake out. That's actually, that's... Quite frankly, a position I didn't expect to hear because I. Why? I find. We want people same, to be able to. You, we're paying for it and they're lying to us. I find that a lot of people who knock on Amtrak for losing a, what amounts to a trickle, I think, on. No, but it's a monopoly. <laughs> Come on. Give Chick fil A the franchise. I promise you they won't lose $72 million a year. Like it's a monopoly and they can't make money. Well, that, that's fine, but in contrast to a lot of people, you say toll the freeways, pay for them through the use of these. I don't find that sentiment among most people I ask. Interesting. The people should pay for what they use. All right, hi. Um, no, and in fact, but, I, I'm sorry, I'm just confused sorry. by your I just want to find why you're. The libertarian position is we'd have private, you know, fire departments. Why would you be surprised that a conservative would say, pay a toll? <laughs> and I'm not a libertarian, though. I'm more libertarian than most libertarians. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Um, going to keep this short. How do you feel about creationists? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, it's not creationists. That's, uh, I mean, I suppose I could embrace it the way Reagan embraced Star Wars. You kids weren't born. Um, but we, we have this great system, um, the high frontier system that would shoot down incoming nuclear bombs, and it brought the Soviet Union to its knees. It was one of the greatest triumphs in modern history. And Reagan wouldn't give it up. Gorbachev couldn't compete with the Soviet Union, obviously being the Soviet <coughs> Union, an entire country run on Obamacare principles. They didn't have any money. Um, but liberals had to ridicule it because they were taking the side of the Soviets and secretly wanted the Soviets to win the Cold War. So they ridiculed the high frontier uh, missile system that Reagan was pushing by calling it Star Wars after a movie to make it sound silly. And uh, Reagan just embraced it and started calling it Star Wars himself. So maybe I'll do that with creationism, but that is not the term um, I would use, we use intelligent design. About a third of my book, Godless, is on Darwinism, um, for which there is no proof and lots of evidence against it. That's not true, the though. Entire, <laughs> the entire paleontology record, they have to keep rearranging bones at the University of Chicago, because you've seen those the little horse becomes the next horse, the next horse, and then, oops, they found something else, and we just made this up, because we small, plus all small horse, and then did a bigger horse. When Darwin 
wrote the origin of the species, I mean, the whole point is you need a new species. You don't want just beaks getting bigger and smaller, which is what happened in the Galapagos Islands. Um, the finches, when it rained, their beaks were short. When it was, um, when there was a drought, their beaks were long, much as New Yorkers um, in the summer <laughs> thin down and get darker by going to the Hamptons. That doesn't give us a new species. We're looking for something new. And there's no evidence that any, anything novel has been created. What you see is the same basic design changing in this way or that way. Um, but what I was starting to say, the most important thing was that Darwin said if, if it could be shown that there is any novel biological aspect that could not be created by small incremental gradual changes, my theory would absolutely fall apart. Of course, when Darwin wrote on the origin of the species, no one knew what a cell was. No one knew what a cell was. A cell. Bill Gates calls the cell a more complex mechanism than the most advanced computer we've ever developed. Now we have high power, power um, microscopes where you can see the cell, and there are you know, 60 different parts to only one part of the cell. So how does each part arise by accident of mutation? And each part, of course, according to the theory of Darwin, has to be more desirable than not. I mean, as Michael Behe has written in Darwin's Black Box, think of something as simple as a mousetrap. A mousetrap has only three parts. But any one part by itself does not make the mechanism more fit, more competitive. It makes it nothing at all. So by now, Darwin's theory has been disproved. That's uh, my answer. That's false, but thank you for your time. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You advocate for uh, freedom of speech, correct? <laughs> or no? And what's your position on slavery? You are against it? <laughs> yeah. I just um, want to get that clear just, before we go forward. Yeah, no, but like... No, no, no. You said... Perfect. Are you against slavery? Yes. Okay. Okay, and you are with your question. question. Speech. Sure. But you don't believe that women should be able to act on what they believe in? Are we through voting? Are we going to women's suffrage? I just said it was a joke. Yeah. But like, how do you... Like, why would you this just... This is the problem with women's suffrage. Even when I say it's a joke, you won't believe me. <laughs> but not like want us to be able to act on what our thoughts are through voting. But you can act on my like, okay, we'll just separate that I said it was a joke. You can act on your thoughts. Write all you want. I write. I write, I speak. Get a gun, defend yourself, buy property. Just one little thing. I'm suggesting the world would be better if women didn't do. Oh. Because of what like you say that. Because you vote for liberal? liberals. Because <laughs> You don't want us to be able to vote because we have liberal views. They we tend towards liberal views. Bingo. But like the point of a democracy and like to have different opinions and be able to express those opinions by express voting. your opinion. Yes. Go but right you're ahead. saying that unless it's not a li unless it's um not a li yeah not a liberal uh, opinion, you don't want us to be able to express it. No, I didn't. I don't want you to vote at all. <laughs> Even if express your opinion to your face. Hi, um, how do you reconcile your faith in the free market given the rise in corporate profits and the very sluggish response in the rise in wages and jobs? Um, to quote my friend Mickey Cows, I used to think everything was about sex, now I see it's all about immigration. <laughs> it's because you're dumping low wage workers. I mean, I've written about this. Instead of artificially raising the minimum wage and then excluding some people from the workforce altogether, stop importing low-wage workers. Australia did it, New Zealand did it, and then the, the minimum wage automatically rises to well, the law of that. Still talking, still talking, you're like Alan Combs. <laughs> the minimum wage rises through the iron law of supply and demand. I'm against fake corporate profits, and I think there's a lot of that, now I'm moving to a separate point, which is I think there's a lot of corruption. And a lot of big businesses and double dealing, and as, as I just mentioned with Wall Street, and I hate that. And, and Republicans are the party that is against, that are against that. The businessmen I like are the ones who go out and create something and do something. 
I'm always suspicious of these money manipulators with their friends on Wall Street. Incidentally, in that guy, uh, you obviously all know about uh, Bernie Madoff, and remember there was that um, Greek securities dealer um, or security guy um, who had warned the SEC about Madoff and said, this is fake, he can't be making these profits. I forget what his name was, Mark Galopoulos or something, but he wrote a book about it, he was very famous, because he had warned the SEC years before Madoff got caught. In his book, he says he was told that Chuck Schumer called the SEC and told them to back off Madoff. And of course, Chuck Schumer had appeared in, on the trading floor of Madoff's outfit. So contrary to what Hollywood movies would have you believe, no, it's way more, especially when we're talking about Wall Street, it's way more Democrats who are defending the big businesses with their inside deals. I mean, as Milton Friedman said, the first thing any two businessmen will do when they get together is conspire to raise prices and, and increase demand. Um, that's why we have antitrust laws, and I think they should be enforced properly. But some of the corporate pro profits, I think, are being made in corrupt ways. Thank you. Um, you've been speaking uh, pretty frequently um, about different ways that the Democrats and the Republicans, um, both in their own ways, try and manipulate the political system for their own party's benefit. Um, what advice would you have for a college student who's potentially either dissatisfied with the current system and or you know, has lost faith in it and doesn't want to know part? Don't lose faith yet. If amnesty goes through, lose faith. <laughs> then just go build your computer. <laughs> and just, no, then it's over. Um, my advice to college students interested in politics would probably be, and especially at a fine <coughs> college like this, would be not to go into politics at first. It would be to go out, get a job. Oops, I just remembered the economy. Um, try to get as good a job as you can get, bat it around, get get fired, find out what you're good at, and 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 do something, and then go into politics. Um, maybe go work if you're really interested. I'm not saying it would be really fun to go work in Washington for a year or two, but I think a lot of kids who are young and enthusiastic to go to Washington get stuck there, and you're always just going to be a lowly, low-paid servant of Washington. Um, they always say Washington is a city of power, but the truth about Washington is it's the opposite of that. No one has any power. It's a city of suck-ups. Everyone is <coughs> sucking up to someone else, and in a way it's only that way with checks and balances, but even, I mean, it sort of filters down to the staff where, you know, the lobbyists are sucking up to the congressmen, and the congressmen are sucking up to the lobbyists, and the president, at least one who doesn't think he's an emperor, is sucking up to Congress, and Congress sucking up to the president and de Democrats and Republicans. It's, it can be fun and exciting, the issues, but I'd recommend, especially people, that, like I say, with bright futures ahead of them like this, to not get stuck too long in Washington. Go and do what it is you need to do for yourself, and then get involved in politics. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, before I get to my question, which is on unemployment and garbage metrics that they use to <laughs> create jobs, I did want to speak to the students in full support of what you've been saying all along. I sat in these chairs 35 years ago. I graduated here as a chemical engineer, got my master's degree here. Together in four years, I invented that program, and some of you do masters in four. Worked for the biggest oil company in the world, Exxon. Was shipped over to Saudi Arabia was woken up most mornings by an F-15 scrambling over my apartment as they scrambled to protect oil tankers that were getting hit by the Iranians. Remember that with the Iran-Iraq war. I lived there during that. Came back, average salary was $16,000, $20,000 a year. Came back with $120,000 in one year tax break. That was the Reagan years, okay? I started my own company after I left Exxon. I would hire two or three Stevens graduates a year. Pay them better than the market. Most of them went off to medical school. Some of them you've actually read about in the Stevens Indicator as being world leaders, okay? That stopped. That stopped about seven or eight years ago. I now pay $38,000 a year 
in health insurance. Because my good policy, that was only about $12,000 a year, very good policy, was bad. I now, at the age of 57, have maternity coverage. <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't say my family that. I have maternity coverage. My wife's policy has her own maternity coverage. $38,000 a year. Haven't hired a Stevens graduate in years. This is something you think about when you close the curtain and pull the lever. Okay? It's gotten very, very different. Yeah, I'm glad you told them that because this I, can, I talk to so many people like you, and this is part of the reason. I want them to move to Canada when Reagan so got it. I was just newly graduated in 1980. Oh my God, we're going to go to war. You know, I, I literally you know, I filled out my, <laughs> what do you call it, the absentee ballot right. in 84. When you're over there, you know, where's the female branch? Let's get Reagan back in there again. It was a very, very different country. When we get the face of the again. Form, Really, a we almost had right it. Now. We almost had it. Yeah. You know, we almost well, had Teddy it. Well, Teddy Kennedy threw a wrench in the world. Well, okay. I'm not going to blame you on this one, but our friend Christie put his arm around the wrong guy after Sandy. Is what Bill but says. That's true. But it really that, didn't make a change. Well, he got like, more, but but looking yeah. at demographics, Reagan it, got uh, a much higher percentage. He may have gotten the highest percentage ever. Maybe not 84, because everyone. For Reagan in 84, it's hilarious. Yeah. Those numbers. Oh, those are the cell with this. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but so, to my question, more of the we see a lot of um, reports and metrics every month on job creation, and the bottom was probably 2007, 2008. If you shave off the creation and growth of the back and shale for fracking and Houston pipeline oil industry, we're probably at about the same level of unemployment rate or employment that we were all along. And so things really have not gotten better. So now the question, what do we do to better present employment metrics, wage metrics, and so forth, versus how many low wage paid job recruiters right. at Chick-fil-A right. before we give them the Amtrak contract? <laughs> okay. And um, you know, what do we do to show how bad things really are? No, there are numbers like that out there. Um, but they're not the ones that are up front. No, the, you're the, right, the but that's always true. The and Republicans aren't really talking about it because a big part of that is the vast majority of these new jobs were taken by immigrants. Center for Indi um, Immigration Studies had established that. But the number of people who wrote it, remember that guy? It was just like two weeks ago. And he went back after he wrote this column, he went back on CNBC and said, I take back my attack on the unemployment numbers. I, I don't want to die on my way home tonight. <laughs> um, I think he was being dramatic. But still, he did, I think it was in Business Week. It was linked on Drudge a few weeks ago, at least his take back, because it was funny and dramatic. But he went through the numbers. And as many of you probably know, since you're going to be looking for jobs soon, um, the number of what they count as unemployed, as, as you know, is only someone who's currently looking for a job. So if you've been out of work for three months already, you don't count. So you have, you're have you not counting the long-term unemployed. That's one category you don't count. They also don't count people who graduate with engineering degrees but are working at Chick-fil-A. That doesn't count. You've got a job. They don't count people who have part-time jobs but would rather have a full-time job. That's the sort of breakdown we need, and we did get it from this one guy. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Like I say, I think it was business week, but it could have been something else. And they don't count people whose benefits have extended beyond the 98 weeks. Right. And they've just simply fallen off as a statistic. Right. You're not on a piece of paper anymore, you don't care. No, but I. But they're I, there. They're still looking. I'm mostly, I mean, LA exactly. in New York, I know lots of people with lots of different professions. It is bad out there. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, um, so more and more states recently have been legalizing pot. Uh, I just want to know what what you think, like federal legalization, like what that would lead to. I just want to point out what a very impressive and serious school this is, that that wasn't the first question. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 I'm totally against it. Um, I'm, I, th I think it makes, I mean, some people can, can smoke pot. Um, but I think it makes people dumb, and I don't want a retarded populace. Um, particularly people, I mean, medically, uh, please stay away from pot at least until you're 26, um, because it really does um, 
it really does lower your IQ. There are many studies on that. And even after that, it just this isn't just a, a matter of taste. You're talking, I mean, about the future of the country and the workforce. And not not everyone, but the potheads, to use a precise medical term, um, they're really useless. I mean, they're fun. <laughs> but come on, does anybody have any trouble getting pot? It wasn't that hard, was it? <laughs> Even when we keep it illegal, at least it keeps, you know, but once it's legal, so many more people will take it. You know, we have a few potheads to make, you know, the Grateful Dead candles and the merchandising and stuff. But when it's legal, you're going to have so many more people taking it. I, I, I'm a deadhead. I used to follow them. And this was in the, when I was in, in college in the Reagan years, um, <laughs> we'd look out across the sea of deadheads and tie-dye and, you know, the drum circles and doing the sliding through the mud and say, what are the Soviets worried about? <laughs> Is this the future of America? And, okay, most of us, you know, recovered and went back to work at Department yeah, of Justice awesome. or wherever I was working. <laughs> but um, I, I am totally against this pop legalization. I don't know if you saw this week. There were all these headlines and the big arguments, which I always really hate. It's like Cuomo pushing gambling. I'm more against legal gambling than I am against pot, and that's pretty far against. Um, but whenever I hear the argument, oh, we're going to raise money off of this, you know, what's it going to do to the citizen? Um, and the claim that Colorado was going to be printing money with taxes over marijuana legalization turned out to be a total fraud. Um, there was an accident headline that said Colorado had, had, was reimbursing citizens this year. And so all these web pages, I don't know if you guys saw this, I think it was like done, I don't know, maybe garage yesterday. Um, all these, these magazines, newspapers, Huffington Post, Time Magazine, everybody was printing huge tax bonanza for Colorado from, from pot legalization, and then it turned out they just looked at the numbers wrong. Um, under the Colorado Constitution, they are required to send tax rebates to citizens for any money they don't need. So it happens every year. They raised, they were, in, they were anticipating to raise about 100 million. Allegedly, they raised like 30 million. So it obviously fell quite far, far of expectations because people don't want to pay the taxes on pot, so they're still buying the pot illegally. But also, I just don't think that's the argument anyway. I mean, Cuomo says we're going to raise money on, on gambling, much like pot and many other vices, <laughs> um, not everyone will become a problem gambler, but for those who do, it's a bigger problem than drugs. At least with drugs, I mean, at some point your body gives out and you pass out or you die. With gambling, for the addicts, and I hope none of you have any experience with this, People will start, they will steal from their mothers, from their wives, from their families. They'll gamble a house away. And, and it does affect the poor the most. I mean, I just feel like, you know, the liberals are willing to turn the entire country into Pottersville of it's a wonderful life, as long as they can print their money and the rich can do well. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, but also real quick, uh, Stevens Dramatic Society in, on May 5th and May 6th, I don't know how I feel about South Park, but we're going to be doing a shoutcast of South Park figure longer up night if you want to come back and watch it. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm really just for the views across the river. Hi, Ms. Holder, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So I'm an alien from China, and I just want to clear out that uh, most of us plan is to uh, go back to China to find jobs, so that uh, it is people in this room who hate me as a potential uh, immigrant, as we talked before. So uh, one quick question is that uh, the uh, communist uh, government kind of forced this education upon us that uh, the U.S. has to uh, find the common enemy since the uh, Democrats and the Republicans are fighting this much. You, you are going to need a common enemy to hold this, to glue this nation together. It's either Soviet Russia or ISIS or North Korea or potentially China. So I'm wondering if this is the really truth, because I'm starting to suspect. And uh, the second one is, uh, let's say if you, tonight, if you have the power to let the liberal, let the Democrats, uh, who, who, who is the source of this uh, immigrant, the, uh, whatever problem, the, the Obama care, uh, to let them just judge and obey to uh, you and your uh, Democrat, uh, your uh, Republican opinions, do you think this country will be like a better place? 
I would totally take the Chinese approach and just kill them all. <laughs> so I don't discard all of the communist ideas. <laughs> um, depending on whether you would vote Republican or Democrat, I'm either sorry or happy you'll be going back. Um, and do we need a common enemy? My gosh, no, we got, got no. No, we've got the, the common enemy are the Democrats. Haven't I made that clear? I don't even care about ISIS. I'm glad you ended here. Hi. Matt Drudge said at the National Press Club in 1977 in what I think was a great speech. Not 77. Uh, I don't think he was born around. 1997, sorry. 97. <laughs> Probably later than that, but that Monica Lewinsky story broke in 98. It was in 1997, 1998. 98. That individual bloggers and reporters would overtake the big media. Um, Sites like this have done very well, but what do you think this will completely happen and it's over? That's a great question. And yes, Matt Drudge was a seer. Um, He's, the Drudge Report is obviously massive massively influential. Um, it's interesting, it hasn't happened exactly the way we thought it would. I mean, for example, you can't really make money unless you're Matt Drudge. Uh, writers or you know, blog writers and so on. I mean, all these web pages, I don't know if you've noticed, like Huffington Post, and Daily Beast, Daily Colorado, they all have like 20 year olds writing for them and they're all living, <laughs> they're all living like immigrants in, in home, you know, 20 to a one, one bedroom apartment. Um, and they're just, you know, producing content, content, content. And at the same time, because you can get, well, step two is the one good thing is people aren't relying on the traditional news for the news anymore. And so, you know, people will hear there was a shooting in, in Ferguson, Missouri. And they don't wait for the evening news. They don't even go to CNN. They go online to find out what the truth is. So that's a good thing. If you want to find the truth, you can find it. That's good for democracy. When I think of some, how some of the stories would have gone, I, I mean, again, you guys were in kindergarten, but the, the, the Dan Rather mocked up National Guard documents claiming that George Bush shirked his National Guard doing a major investigative story. They went up online. This has been, been vetted through level after level. They go up online and within about 10 minutes, this is where the expression um, PJ TV and PJ media came from. Bloggers in their pajamas looked at the documents and saw that they were, you know, weren't perfect documents that weren't even available until 1990 or, or whenever. Um, so they were not actual documents from from George Bush's <laughs> guard service. It was total humiliation. Um, even worse, I'd say, than Brian Williams' endless fantasies, was ultimately fantasies about himself, because he's trying to, Dan Rather was trying to take down a sitting president in wartime. With, but for the internet, that could not have happened. I don't think the Ferguson story would have gone the same way. Um, the Trayvon Martin story, I mean, remember how NBC, I don't know how much you guys pay attention to this, but NBC mocked up when that, you, you remember Trayvon Martin, Martin, he was the black kid who was shot by the um, community watch guard and the, um, he was being beat and he said he was on his back and that's what the jury found and so he reached for his gun and shot Trayvon Martin. When he called the police to report a suspicious looking individual, NBC altered the tape. He said there's a suspicious looking individual, I don't recognize him from around here, he has a hood over his head, he's walking in, you know, the dark areas or something, and the dispatcher says to him, um, can you tell what race he is? And, and George Zimmerman, the accused, um, later the accused, said, I'm not sure he looks black. NBC took this tape and edited it, so all you heard, George, they played it this way, with George Zimmerman saying, I see a suspicious, suspicious looking character. He looks black. They used to be able to get away with that. So in many ways, it's, it's, it's changed the world. On the other hand, and the final step is, I think a lot of the mainstream media has become far less fair than it used to be. Because, <laughs> because they figure out, they can go read the Drudge Report if they want the truth. This is our side. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, last one.
Um, hi. Um, I just have a question. Uh, last year, you uh, made headlines around the time of the World Cup for a few controversial statements. Yes. <laughs> totally um, not controversial. This is um, a direct quote from you, from your blog. Uh, any, the whole thing. All right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Any growing interest in soccer can only be a sign of the nation's moral decay. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's basically you just have like a bunch of things like just yeah. dissing soccer, saying like how it's bad, like number five, you can't use your hands in soccer, so that's, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> you say like what sets men apart from lesser beasts beside the soul is that we have opposable thumbs, our hands can hold things. Exactly. These are all direct quotes from you, by the way. Um, <laughs> If I thought you would read it with feeling, I would have you read the entire column. Instead, I'm just going to recommend that all of you go back. It was right at the time, it was around, uh, it was in July, it was around the time of the World Cup. One of the most magnificent columns I've ever written. And then, you know, some Frenchies attacked me. Um, so I had a, a follow-up column, hilariously enough, from Paris, where I was the night Algeria was playing, I, get, I forget who they were playing, I don't think it was Paris, but there are a lot of Algerians in Paris, but whomever they were playing, Germany maybe? Who cares? Um, suddenly Paris erupts, there's like rioting in the streets, the, the police are lining every street, and we're trying to figure out what happened in this World Cup game, I mean, I don't even know who, who won, but the Algerians looked really happy. It was a tie. Okay, that's my point. <laughs> That's my point with soccer. It goes on and on and on, and three hours later, maybe there's one person scoring. You go past billboards, exciting games, zero, zero. Three hours later, it's zero, zero. Oh my gosh, it's boring. <laughs> it is not an American sport, young man. I brought a lot of paperbacks, so those are only $20. I have a selection of books, but then I have some of my last book in hardcover. I think we're doing all right here. Thank you.